Dear colleagues, my name is Tanja Hüsch. I'm the medical director of Promodown and I welcome you to our men's health debate meeting. In the next one and a half hours, we will have an intense uh, session about the surgical treatment of male stress urinary incontinence presented by the experts in this field. So I will now give the word to my appreciated colleague, Professor Ricarda Bauer from Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich, Germany. Thank you, Tanya, and um, thank you for the, for the introduction. And especially a thank, warm thank you uh, for organizing this uh, meeting today. So I would like to welcome everybody to our virtual men's health meeting today. Um, we have really three very well-known experts for male incontinence with us today. It's Professor Cartier Kastler from Paris, Professor Hübner from Vienna and Professor Zachowal from Prague. Welcome, guys. I'm really happy to, to see you here and to, to have you here today. Um, we are really happy to have the opportunity to discuss with you the latest news on male incontinence treatment, um, patient selection, and especially brand new data of the victor sphincter. Um, as everybody of you knows, the main reason for male stress incontinence is the radical prostatectomy and post-prostatectomy incontinence has really a major impact on quality of life of the patients. Unfortunately, up to 5% uh, of the patients even undergo surgical treatment for their incontinence. Um, I think these numbers highlight the high patient demand for successful surgical uh, therapies. Um, However, there are still a lot of questions mark, uh, marks today. For example, we have no standardized um, definition of incontinence. What is the best treatment for which patient, which, which examination is necessary? What are the best outcome criteria for studies? Um, so a lot of questions we still have to answer. And um, therefore, I'm very pleased to have Professor Cartier Castler with us. He will give us some insights into general news in the treatment of male stress incontinence. And welcome, Emmanuel. Great to have you here today. Thank you, Ricarda. I will share my slides. So, Ricardo, thank you very much for this uh, nice invitation and thank Promedon for the great invitation too. It's always a pleasure to discuss about uh, uh, stress urinary incontinence in male patients as it seems that within the last years uh, some improvement uh, is uh, rising and we hope for the future new developments for new uh, devices. For sure I have to disclose some conflict of interest. So, Definitively, when we discuss about stress and incontinence in men, uh, we, as Ricarda said, it's always related, quite always related to uh, prostate surgery and uh, very, uh, very often to uh, radical prostatectomy for prostate cancer management. Some patients may suffer neurogenic condition, but it's not our topic today. And whatever the treatment we will use, uh, uh, we always have to keep in mind that there is no real medical treatment and that pelvic floor muscle therapy is definitively not able to cure patients. It has to be used at the post-op period of radical prostatectomy, but for a patient suffering a mild, moderate or severe incontinence, most of the time it will not cure him, it will help him. And that's why uh, there is a surgery need for uh, some patients. And whatever the surgery, and I will come back on that, whatever the surgery, whatever the type of surgery you will select, you have to be very careful and to evaluate the patient preoperatively, to check comorbidities, to check severity of incontinence, which may be part of the selection of treatment and other speakers will speak about it. And we have to discuss techniques with the patient. Currently, we have three options. The artificial urinary sphincter, which is the austerical one and very valid, very well validated too. The male slings, adjustable or not, and the compressing device, which are named pro-ACT balloons. And this uh, slide was just to remind you that if patients are suffering stress urinary incontinence after radical prostatectomy, 
it's uh, for many reasons, but the main reason is because we remove uh, prostatic urethra with a blood or neck passive continence mechanism, and the, the remnant part of urethra uh, is not uh, working the same from one patient to one other, and it's impossible to predict if the patient may be dry or not after surgery. And uh, so definitely, we have to take care of our patients who suffer stress in our incontinence. Just quickly, this slide from the EU guidelines, just to uh, underline again that uh, there is no, not, there are not so many options uh, except surgery for patients who suffer stress in urinary incontinence after management of uh, uh, evaluation of the lower urinary tract symptoms. If the patient is suffering a failure of the drug therapy, there is in only one duloxetine, as I said, it's not efficient, not sufficiently to keep patients dry. Surgery, it will be time for surgery. The first surgery, as my goal in this presentation, is to give you an overview about what we, uh, what we can use at this moment. A artificial neuroscience center is a, is, a very fun, is a fantastic concept because it's a device which is able to reinforce sphincter function. The patient is able to manage uh, time to go to toilets and to open his sphincter when he wants. It may be used for children, male, female, neurogenic and non-neurogenic. So it's a tool which has a huge uh, panel of indications. And this device uh, has, doesn't have any impact on the voiding phase, except technical problems. With this device, patients are able to open the sphincter and so to have a free flow rate. This device, the artificial neural sphincter, has a long story. And as we will discuss about the new Victor sphincter, I, I, I guess it was interesting to just to have a look on these fantastic past devices, which are the past devices uh, of the AMS 800 from Boston Scientific. And this device uh, came from many pumps, many tubes to the, I would say, the simple, the most simple we can use today, which is the AUS uh, AMS 800 with one, one pump, one balloon to keep the pressure inside the closed system and one cuff. And this system is an hydraulic one. In main, the system is placed at the bulbar area. There is no other place to, play to in, implant it in men after radical prostatectomy, for sure. And for those who suffer incontinence after TURP, definitely uh, it cannot be implanted at the prostatic area. The only indication for prostatic area implantation is for neurogenic patients, and it's not our topic today. Uh, to make the story short, uh, when I'm used to teach this technique to my fellows, well, I'm used to say that the most important part is to be able to dissect under clear eye control uh, between urethra with the spongious tissue around and corpus cavernosum. And always, and I like this slide because this slide is showing that it's not dissected at the best place it should be. You see here the superficial pelvic floor muscles. And the best place to dissect is the bulbar area. And if we can, the most deep one in the, in the perineum. Such a place will be protecting the urethra. The urethra is more sick and it will be more safe for the long term. Definitely, it's, it's a device with a pump. The pump has to be placed at uh, the scrotum level. Um, we are more keen to promote perineal incision and an inguinal one for the balloon and pump implantation. Some advocate for the penoscrotal approach. It's another debate, but you, should you use it, you have to be very careful about uh, the risk of this uh, um, route. As we uh, know now that it has to be implanted at the best place of bulbar urethra for some patients, we are suffering recurrence of incontinence after removal of uh, past artificial sphincter. If it was for erosion or infection, you have to know that in some patients it may be indicated to implant the device through a transcavenosal approach. Uh, it has to be part of your armamentarium because uh, you never know what you will find when you will dissect, and at least when it's for recurrence of incontinence after past failed device which has been removed whatever the reason, if it was for infection or erosion. Sometimes a pump may be misplaced. And as you can see on this X-ray control, you see the pump came up 
it should be down. Uh, it's something you have to control postoperatively. Whatever the device is, there is a pump in the scrotum area, it has to be checked within the next days after surgery to be sure the pump will stay before uh, to be fixed by the fibrotic uh, process of healing. Should we give some, uh, uh, I would say, uh, very validated results? I like this paper from the Mayo Clinic reporting about 1,082 patients, which is giving a, a very good device survival risk of the device. And as a primary implantation, it's at 5.74% of the device which are still there and 57 at 10 years. Uh, which is rather good because we are used to say that the median survival rate of the device is eight years uh, in men. And for the Mayo Clinic, it seems that uh, the 50% is more than 10 years. And I don't see the full table on my screen because the screen is shared, but um, uh, you, you, they checked for uh, risk factors associated with surgery. And uh, what they found is that um, primary implantation has always a longer uh, and better follow-up than a secondary uh, implantation. What about the uh, messages regarding the risk factors? The uh, younger age and penoscrotal approach in this uh, other report from Elstrom in Canada were associated with higher device implantation and revision rate. And uh, the use of a tandem cuff, which is promoted by some teams, but which is not, uh, which is not a routine practice and not promoted by EAU guidelines, at least, uh, suffer higher risk of expansion. If you have to know a lot of things about artificial sanctuary, you have to check the uh, uh, consensus conference, which was held under the auspice of ICS in 2015. And this conference is summarizing all uh, the main topics regarding AUS implantation. Now it's really the gold standard worldwide. It has 40 years of experience. It's a specialized procedure. So you have to be trained. And this report is giving you all of the elements you have to know to implant and to follow the patient. So refer to this fantastic paper. And finally, with the MS800, where do we know some positive aspects? It's a high continuance rate. It's about 85% of patients who are try or who suffer what we call continence, social continence. Uh, there is a normal voiding pattern because there is no resistance at the voiding phase. There is a high level of satisfaction and quality of life. Uh, there is no or few impact on sexual life. And there is a good life expectancy of the device. It's about more than eight years in men, as I said. Negative aspects, it may, it may suffer infection and revision rate is significant. It means that it may be related to uh, the failure of the device itself or to uh, complications around the device with urethra uh, at the perineal level. So finally, the ideal prosthesis, which has been well defined in this report, it should be easy to manipulate and inactivate. Uh, the cuff pressure should be able to be modified, which is something the AUS and IMS 800 cannot do. Um, it should be able to adapt uh, upon real-time manner. It means depending on activities of the patient at this moment, it's not possible. It should be as robust and as simple as possible. It should be safely implanted via a minimally invasive procedure. It's quite, it's quite the case for the AS800 and it should be as a good cost and for all countries. But some key points have not been solved. And as I said, there is no reinforcement of pressure when coughing. So the patient has to pump and probably one day some uh, patients will no more have to pump because we know that some devices could develop using electronic or electric call systems. And at this moment, it's a three piece device and it could be one piece. So should you find uh, the level, should you be willing to see the level of evidence, you will find it in the EAU guidelines. And uh, it's a shame, but with, uh, EUS 800, uh, you will never find the level of evidence one because no prospective comparative studies have been, have been done in the past when this system went to clinical development in the years, in the eighties. So it's disappointing, but we will never get it. Probably we will get it with some new devices. And at this device didn't change so much 
the main change with time was the creation of the narrow back cuff to um, have a better, uh, I would say, compensation of the pressure on the urethra. As you see here, it's a cuff today, different from the past non-narrow back cuff in the, at the first, with the first device. So uh, definitely, uh, we don't know what is the comparator, and it has been, uh, it is a fantastic device, and it has to be promoted. What about male slings? Male slings, uh, it's, it's a very old story, more old than the AUS. Uh, I like these drawings from the past commuter and Kaufman uh, ex, uh, experience uh, in the 1670s and of the past century. Uh, you all know the invents, which was fixed with some screw at the pubic, uh, on the pubic bone. Uh, it failed, whatever the reason, so it's no more on the market. We have some things which are on the market and used in some countries, uh, depending of the proce reimbursement process and also training of surgeons. The uh, eye stop from Tom's is a four arms and uh, which has to be fixed without any dissection of the bulbar muscles. That's why I show it. And the results have been uh, uh, published with prospective data and rather good results because with this, uh, um, sorry, uh, with this uh, uh, experience of 103 patients with one year of follow up, it was 60% dry, which is about the rate for one year follow up of patients who uh, will have indication for male slings and with a low level of infection and no, in, no reporting of obstruction, which is nice. So there are good data which has to be which have to be followed with time. There are not so many uh, reports on long term with this device today. The advanced one from uh, past American medical system now Boston Scientific is well known, and it's not the same technique of implantation because it's uh, implanted at the bulbar level after opening and dissection of the bulbar muscles. Fantastic studies have been done. Uh, it's very well known. Uh, most of the good experts with this technique are online today. And we know that it's about 76, about two thirds of patients who are dry and improved and stable at three years. Uh, the major inconvenience of this device is that you cannot adapt. And if the patient is suffering recurrence of incontinence with time, you have to reoperate. And for sure, some patients may suffer complication of measures, but not so much as it's as reported uh, through literature. And at time of uh, mesh um, uh, problems with um, female patients, I'm not sure there is a big feature for all of these devices in males. Some other devices have been developed. You have to refer to your local experience, local availability of these devices, depending on uh, what you can do under ethical committee approval or not. Uh, the Argus system is adaptable uh, with some retropubic uh, uh, silicone uh, tubes. Uh, the Remix system is adaptable with a screw able to give some tension to the mesh which is placed at the bulbar urethra. So all of this and uh, the M sling and also you can, we can speak about the virtue things. There are a lot of things. The Pro ACT balloon, the last type of technique uh, it's a mini invasive technique. It's probably the only one within the three techniques I described, which is really a mini invasive. You just have to puncture uh, at, at the perineal level, uh, left and right from the bulbar area to uh, implant balloons. Sorry. And uh, this technique uh, has been very well described. It has to be done very uh, easily under uh, general or local anesthesia, it depends. And now this technique of the armatorium of most of the countries. Uh, definitely whatever is related to uh, post prostatectomy or post TURP, uh, post radical prostatectomy or post TURP, it has to be placed as a natty sphincter of the patient. I like these images from the Ricarda paper. How is it working? probably by compression, as you can see through this endoscopic view of this 3D reconstruction, um, more compression than, than uh, sustaining because we know that these patients suffer a decrease of the flow rate. A lot of papers have been published now, a lot of clinical studies. It went to reimbursement in my country since January 1st, 2020. 
And I just listed the papers just to, to show you that it depends on the long the, the timing of follow-up, but it's between two thirds of patients who are dry and 75 to 80 percent of those who are uh, improved. But be careful, all results are not reported as intention to treat. So it's really invasive, it's adjustable, reversible. It doesn't compromise the future for a future IUS. And um, uh, the technique may be used, uh, may be done either through X-ray uh, or uh, ultrasound control. So what is the future? And it's quite close to my, the end of my talk. The future of new IUS, you will find a lot of papers. I, I listed some references. Uh, just to make the story short, mechanical devices, devices, it failed. And one is under development with Mario Powers. I don't have any data about it, but it's some, some type of mechanical uh, device which has to be followed. Uh, the hydraulic system, the Frosecure, which is now the Victor, the Sephir, they are close to the AUS IMS 800, but with some differences, and each of it have, has to demonstrate that it's efficient. Electronic and hydraulic, it's what is working about the Boston Scientific to, to remove the pump of the AUS IMS 100 and to transform it with a pure electronic system. Why not? And Euromaps is working on the same type of device. And we, wa we wait for clinical studies to start, uh, I hope, as soon as possible, but I don't get the information at this moment. And some magnetic systems are also under development. So finally, for the grade of recommendations, whatever this device, this device you will select, the grade of recommendation is always B to C. It's really A. And finally, before to give the podium to my friends, which will give you some information about new devices and new artificial sphincter, don't forget that first you have to evaluate your patients. Then you have to select the good surgical treatment. You have to know how to implant it and you have to follow up to get to follow the patient very carefully because you implant a device. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emmanuel, for the excellent overview. Um, I, I have a question. I would like to know, Emmanuel, I know this is, uh, this is really a tricky question, but I think everybody of us will agree that there is not the ideal prosthesis at the moment. But do you think um, what 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 is the future of the in, in surgical therapy? Do you think there's a chance for one fits all uh, prosthesis, or do we have to select our patient also in the future? Because a lot of us don't like the selection. I'm not really safe with the selection. And what do you think? Where, where's the future? Uh, you, you raise a very important point because uh, as we are used to say that uh, mild patients, mild, mild, mild incontinence uh, should be treated with this treatment at moderate or severe incontinence, these criteria are not very well defined, so they are not the best criteria. So in my practice, what I am used to, to use is the patient. The patient has to tell me what is in, what is suffering, what is the bother, and I will select the best treatment for the best patient as a face-to-face -face discussion. Definitively, I will not indicate any artificial sphincter for a patient who will have one pad every two days, uh, because we know that this patient will not be uh, happy with the AUS because he will still have one pad every two days because he may suffer some drops after avoiding or some leakage when he's sitting on his device. So, uh, to make a, a quick answer, it's the best selection is to discuss with the patient. The patient has to be part of the discussion and he, he can select the treatment he wants if it's affordable and possible for him regarding the, the comorbidities. And then uh, he will be the, the more happy. Uh, don't forget that those patients who suffered radiotherapy, I guess there is no other treatment than artificial noise sphincter. And it's probably uh, this, this is something we can discuss again. So, but so this means in the future we will also have different treatment options, and we will have to select the patients. Uh, uh, I could say I am afraid, yes, or it's a chance for the patient because uh, we have many options, and he can select what is his objective. Do we, does he want to be dry, just to be improved? We are all surprised with uh, women uh, stress and continuous management. 
how some patients who are not dry are very happy. Mm. So we are sometimes lacking of such quality of life and uh, bother improvement mm -hmm. studies. So Our objectives are not always the objective of the patient. So this means it's really important that we really know how to select the patients. Yes.